You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services, your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group and it's us. It's Group M7. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Teresa. We are in show number 46. Yes, we are. Which sounds great, except that it's our last show. <laughs> that, to me, is not great. We ran out of history. I know. <laughs> so uh, I guess somebody needs to go do something good, and then we can <laughs> talk about Another it. Another series, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, let's see. Now, we started out with uh, 80 uh, programs for modern church history, running from the death of Thomas Aquinas up until... Almost the death of John Paul II. Right. Then we did medieval history, about 33 or so um, of those programs. And now we've done early church history running up through that. So the only thing we can do now is future church history. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm real, yeah, I don't think I'm not real safe with that. <laughs> we have a few years of uh, post Pope John Paul and, and Benedict, but there's probably not enough yet there to do. Uh, well, there's probably enough information, but we yeah. probably need to wait a little while. But I think so. <laughs> I would. I do hope. I do hope we will get back someday to do the shows that we originally began airing when when we were back in Illinois. Yes. And I'd love to get you back to do those someday. So the, uh, when you American get a chance, Church. the American yeah. Church history, right? Well, we'll do that someday. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, as long as I know you're going to come back, then, then I'm good. <laughs> okay, we can do that. Right. Um, today we're going to talk about two other individuals. Last time around we talked about two individuals. Remember, uh, Will Fella, mm-hmm. the bishop, uh, Arianist bishop, who converted the Germans, and then also Patrick. Right. And uh, the importance behind both of them were that they were coming out of the classical um, ancient uh, Christian milieu, Mm -hmm. but as we look at them today, we think of them as medieval. So there's kind of that linchpin. And the last two individuals we're going to talk about today are two even more famous, uh, unless you're Irish, then of course that (laughs) could be, but two others uh, who are also incredibly important. One of those, St. Benedict, Mm -hmm. and the other is St. Gregory the Great. And with that, um, those are two other linchpins that are coming out of the ancient and yet we see them as medieval. And so we'll end this whole discussion with what Pope uh, Benedict XVI refers to as the hermeneutics of continuity, understanding the church as a continuous growth rather than what other people sometimes refer to as the hermeneutics of rupture, uh, where you have constant um, uh, disruptions that take place in the church. We've tried to show a continuity of the church beginning with Pentecost, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, Christ sending the Holy Spirit upon Peter and the others, and then running that all the way through 2,000 years of history, all the way up to those last days of John Paul II, showing a continuity in the church. So, anyway, well, we'll say something about that. But St. Benedict uh, lived uh, from 480 to 547, and when he died... Um, there was a, a little boy in Italy by the name of Gregory who was seven years old. So they, uh, their, their lives barely touched chronologically but not physically. Now, we have to realize that when we called this early church history segment the 12 generations, uh, technically the 12th generation ends then at 410 A.D. 
But again, we're seeing this continuity taking place where here are people that are born around that time or slightly after that time reflecting out of that Christian Roman classical milieu and then helping to bring us into, um, in, into the Middle Ages. Right. And, and there is a, a, a smooth continuity that, that's uh, taking place um, with that. So um, we now look at Benedict and at Gregory. Both of these men would have considered themselves out of the classic Christian civilization. And both of them are identified, as I say, with, with the medieval. So um, then what we'll do is we'll be considering the way of, of looking at uh, church history and, um, and all. So well, let's start right away then with Benedict of Nursia. Um, he is called the father of Western monasticism. And uh, in 1966, uh, Pope um, Paul VI actually named him as the patron of Europe. Uh, he is, and then along with that, in 1980, uh, Pope John Paul II added Cyril and Methodius to that, reminding us that Europe breathes with two lungs. Two lungs. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, but we have to, even as we say that Benedict is the father of Western monasticism, we have to remember, and we've already talked about, the fact that monasticism was well underway uh, before Benedict came along in, in the West, uh, certainly in the East with Anthony of Egypt and the other um, flowers of the desert uh, we, we have. But in the West, we also have a, a lot. We've already spoken about uh, St. John, or uh, talking about John Cassian, uh, who brought that Eastern monasticism to the West. We talked about Vincent of Laren and his uh, huge influence with, with his own rule. And Laren are the uh, Larenos, the, the island uh, south of Marseille that uh, becomes this important monastery where Patrick himself had studied and prepared himself for the diaconate. Um, we remember that um, Martin of Tours, um, in, in Tours itself in central France, um, had uh, had a monastery. You know, I came across this, I didn't realize before, but when he died, Martin of Tours died in 397. And at his funeral, there were 2,000 monks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that's incredible. That is incredible. And thousands. Yeah, I mean, it's just wow. <laughs> and and this of course is before uh considerably before uh, Benedict even comes along. He's the father of monasticism because he pulls it together, which we'll right. see in a minute. But um but th th certainly there were lots of monks around before. I was also surprised as I was doing some reading in some of these very old books that I've I've um I picked up over the years and uh uh, they, they talked about one um, a monastery in the uh, in, in Ireland, in Eastern Ireland, uh, in the monastery of Bangor. Okay, and in that monastery, this is in the 500s. There were 3,000 monks in that monastery. 3,000 monks attached to that monastery. They farmed. Yeah, uh, you know, they kept cattle, they uh, sheep, uh, in order to feed themselves, 3,000. Yeah. And they divided themselves up. There are so many, they couldn't fit in the chapel, obviously. <laughs> they were divided into seven choirs. Uh-huh, okay. And these choirs continually said the office, day and night. Just Always. Alternating so that everybody could get in there. Yes. Prayer. I mean, isn't that something? Wow. You've got the example also we talked about uh, St. Paulinus of, of Nola and his wife, uh, Theresia, who had actually brought him to, uh, to the church. And uh, the two of them having dual monastery convents uh, near to each other and he attracting men to uh, his monastery, uh, Theresia attracting um, women to her monastery, both of them with a, f a huge devotion to St. Felix of Nola. And, uh, who was buried in, in that same spot. You've got also in Spain uh, St. Martin of Braga, uh, who is um, taking his monks and going into Spain, and throughout Spain, and reconverting the Aryan Germans. Remember, that was all Visigoth, bringing them back to orthodoxy. Uh, so lots and lots of things. We've already seen St. Augustine, right. of course, you know, when uh, he ends up in, in Hippo, taking his own household and turning it into a monastery. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we talked about Rufinus of Aquilae, and then later also, uh, first of all, in Aquilae, then later on in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerome also going to the Holy Land and setting up his own monastery, right. as well as translation center in Bethlehem. Um, Basil in the east, uh, one of the great uh, early church fathers who was also a founder of Eastern um, uh, monasticism, Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia. So these were all centers of, uh, of monastic life. And Rome, too. Sometimes we forget about the number of monasteries in Rome. That was quite incredible. Um, when St. Augustine visited Rome at one point, he says the following. He says, I know many of them as homes of saints, where in the midst of brethren who live together in love, piety, and freedom, there ever besides one distinguished for moral dignity, wisdom, and ecclesiastical learning. Who said that? Uh, that's St. Augustine. Augustine said yeah, that. Yeah, on a visit to Rome, he wow. had um, come across some of the monasteries there. One of the oldest monasteries in Rome was founded by a pope. This was uh, Pope Sistus III, and uh, it was dedicated to St. Sebastian. It was... Um, uh, then also n near to that, there was another. There was a convent that was also established, and this was uh, set up near St. Lawrence Basilica outside the walls. And um, there you have a, a whole group of consecrated virgins. These are women, some of them widows, some of them very wealthy, some of them not, uh, but women who have consecrated their life to Christ and are living uh, in, in this convent. And, and this is in the 400s and 500s. You know, yeah. sometimes, well, we tend to skip this whole we period do. of history, you know, and it, this is the transition from classical to medieval, mm -hmm. and it's a much smoother transition than our textbooks have a tendency to tell us. Right. You know, you, you right. come to the end <laughs> of civilization. You just fall off and we step <laughs> onto the other one. Yeah, and then you start Chapter 7. <laughs> you know, that's exactly. Right. And it's not like that, you uh -huh. know, it's not like that. Um there is also an, another monastery set up very close to the tomb of St. Peter, which, of course, today is right there in oh the Vatican. Goodness, yeah. um, and that was mainly uh, noble Roman women okay. who have abandoned their, um, their wealth and their palaces and all that and moved mm -hmm. in. Um, Pope Leo the Great also founded a monastery uh, in near, nearby there, too. Um, another... Uh, uh, example of this, uh, or uh, something that would show us uh, something about this, is some of the um, inscriptions of Saint Damasus, uh, Pope Damasus, who um, is, is so famous for his his carvings and 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 finding places of of the catacombs and the martyrs and all that. And then of course, that's all lost for many centuries until. Uh, Giovanni Battista de Rossi comes along and uh, you know finds them all again. But there's one wonderful inscription in which um, he writes a, uh, a, a gravestone for his uh, sister. Uh, his sister was Irene, and evidently a very saintly um, nun. And so Pope Damasus says this. This is the inscription. To whom she has consecrated, he's, he's, he's speaking of her zeal to follow Christ, and he says, to whom she has consecrated herself in holy chastity. And then there's another uh, little plea afterwards. He says, now that God, thy bridegroom, has come, remember us, O virgin, that thy lamp may give us light before the Lord. Oh, that's beautiful. Wasn't that? And, and he, he had that inscribed on her grave. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So, you you, you know, you, you come across Pope Damasus, and you know the things that he did, and all this sort of thing, uh, that Jerome had acted as his secretary, all these things. But, but there's a, here's a human side mm -hmm. of, a, um, of a pope who has a saintly sister, and he mourns her loss, but at the same time, he realizes that she's gone to God, and he asks for a little help from her. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, this is the Rome. This is the Rome that Benedict, as a young boy, comes in contact with. Okay. You know, when he uh, goes to Rome to study, and he's there as a teenager. And so he's, he's, he's drinking in this milieu of, uh, of, of um, such rich uh, heritage and holiness. And around 20 years old, um, 
for some reason that we don't know uh, much about this, but he decides then that he's going to go live that life also. But he has to go to do a preparation first. And so what he did was he left Rome and followed a little river, the Anio River, and he kept on walk, walking up the bank of this river until he found a cave. And he took up residence in this cave. And it was way up on top of the hill, and it overlooked um, what had been a palace that Nero had built. It was a ruins. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine the scene here of, 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 of this, this young man um, struggling to get onto the spiritual journey and living at this, and then looking down into this valley and seeing the hubris of, a, of an ancient Roman emperor. You know, it's, mm -hmm. that's a meditation in itself. Well, uh, the cave itself came to be called by people in the area Sacro Speco, and um, and the place itself is is known as Subiaco, and hence that um, it's taken after the named after a, a lake, the uh, Sublacus Lake, okay. and so then you had uh, the Subiaco. Um, it's not deserted. The area is not deserted. Actually, there are people um, roaming around, particularly herdsmen. This is a rugged terrain, but uh, you, know, you have goats and sheep and all that, and the herdsmen are, are moving uh, in and about. And there's also a monastery nearby. And it turns out that, um, uh, that one of the monks um, heard about Benedict being over there, and uh, went to pay a little visit and realized that poor Benedict had gone without any provisions. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and so this brother, his name is Brother Romanos, uh, would bring bread to uh, Benedict every, uh, every couple of days. Um, but that was about the only visitor for three years. For three years, wow. Benedict lived in this cave, spent his time praying and uh, in seclusion, and, uh, and 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 reading and okay, um, it, it's time went on. Some shepherds came by and visited for a while, and they began to realize that this young man, now still under 25 years old, had a, a tremendous depth to him. And so the shepherds began coming on a more and more uh, regular basis, and um, and they would ask him to teach them catechism. Oh, wow. uh, which he did. And his reputation spread so much that one monastery had lost its uh, abbot. Uh, this was called, this was the, um, the monastery of uh, Vecovaro. And they asked Benedict to become their abbot. And uh, he accepted. Okay. And so he went there. And uh, he was there for a little while when he realized that they were going to try to poison him. The monks were going to try to poison him because his rule was so severe. So strict. So strict. Now, he learned a very important lesson there. And, uh, and it had to do with human nature, and it had to do with grace built on nature. And, uh, and his, what he ends up writing is in the rule of St. Benedict is so balanced um, that I think perhaps some of this came from the experience of having been uh, too severe uh, at the beginning. As I say, uh, he went back then to his uh, his little cave. Others kept coming to him. Uh, some of them didn't um, didn't just come and uh, and listen and leave. Some of them stayed. And uh, and then what he did was he began uh, setting up little little tiny monasteries of twelve men at a time, and um, the. Uh, they would uh, settle into the ruins of this palace. So this is kind of ironic, isn't it? <laughs> you know, here you have Nero's palace, and now several uh, centuries later, you have holy Christian monks who were using that palace then as, uh, or the ruins at least, as monasteries. Eventually, uh, he set up 12 such monasteries. Wow. Twelve monasteries of twelve men. They were not all Romans. Uh, there were a number of Goths that had uh, heard of, uh, of of Benedict and came and joined him also. So it was an interesting group. Um, noble Romans also heard of him and would send their boys to Subiaco uh, for training. And the boys would spend a couple years with Benedict. He would teach them 
the normal um, secular studies, religious studies, the catechism, uh, they would have what you can imagine would be an incredible um, uh, spiritual formation. And then they would go back to Rome and assume their lives. Some. Uh, some of them stayed. Yeah, some of them stayed. Um, there's uh, one in particular uh, young man by the name of uh, Amaurus. And uh, wealthy family, the whole works. He stayed when it was time for him to leave. He asked Benedict to stay on, that he could stay on as his assistant. And so he became a, a companion of, of Benedict uh, working with him. Um, there were other examples, too. There was a young man by the name of um, Placidus. And this, this fellow was the son of, the, of a Roman patrician, a very, very wealthy individual, and, and received his training from uh, Benedict. So we know some names of, uh -huh. of people also. Well, it's too good to, to last. And unfortunately, envy uh, broke in. And, and unfortunately, it came from a priest, uh, one of the local priests, a man by the name of, of Florentius. Father Florentius was jealous. Well, it, it's worse than that. It was envy, envious of um, what Benedict was doing. And he worked very hard to undermine uh, Benedict's efforts. And ultimately, Benedict uh, abandoned Subiaco and then continued going further up into the mountains. And there he found a place. It was an old uh, camp. Uh, it was uh, called the Castrum Cassinum. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at, the, at the top of this, this mountain, it's a little tiny town, a village. Um, and there was the only thing it was known for was a, a temple to Apollo and a little grove that had been planted in, in honor of Apollo. And it had all gone into ruins, ruins by that time. Not, not many people were adoring uh, Apollo. Um, Benedict moves then to this, uh, this castrum. And um, um, as I say, the, the name of it is Castrum Cassinum. Uh, because it's on top of a mountain, uh, it's uh, Monta Cassino. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this was in 529. Benedict is 49 years old. And by now, he understood human nature, mm -hmm. both the good and the bad. He had had plenty of experience with it. And he knew human frailty. And he knew how to lead men to, um, in, on a spiritual journey. And, uh, and, of course, not only men, also his own sister, uh, St. Scholastica, would um, would take up um, the, the same thing and, and establish a, a convent. When we see the history of this, when we realize the number of monks and nuns and and uh, consecrated women and houses of uh, in, in Rome and other places, uh, this is not out of the ordinary. Right. Uh, you know, we see Benedict and, uh, and Scholastica doing something that was actually quite normal, but just doing it extraordinarily well. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, he, um, uh, he the first thing he did was he took those ruins of Apollo and really ruined them. <laughs> uh, he dissembled the, uh, the the statue that was there, tore down the altar, and used the stone then to build a um, a church. And the church was dedicated to Saint Martin of Tours. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's also. Um, uh, that same year that he went into the uh, the trees, the grove of trees, and cut them all down and burned them. Uh, not that he had anything against uh, trees, but uh, these these trees were dedicated to Apollo, and so he was going to wipe out once and for all the um, uh, any semblance of uh, of that pagan religion. It's interesting that the same year he does that is the same year that the emperor closes down the academy in Athens, which had been open since, I mean, with you know, a couple uh, periods of time with wars and all, but had been basically opened since the time of Socrates. Wow. And he closes the academy down because it's not Christian. And what it happens, we've talked about this in an earlier episode, what happens then is that uh, those pagan scholars then move and go even as far away as Parthia. And, but they bring with them the learning of the, of the Aristotelian learning, which is, of course, going to be hidden now for the next 500 years, right. uh, at least from the West. But uh, it, it's interesting that the two of them 
two things happened at the same, same time. Same same time. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I'd like to take a little reading, um, and this is from a, a rather old book. This came out in 1912, and it's written by a Jesuit, um, Hartmann Grisar. Okay. And it's it's uh, the name of it is the history of Rome and the popes in the Middle Ages. Um, I'm sure it's out of print, uh, <laughs> but I, and I, I I got it off of a, a shelf someplace. Actually, I got three volumes of it, oh. and um, it, it's it's kind of a fun read. It, it's uh, actually reading history written around the early 20th century is is very enjoyable. Uh, it, it flows a little the, bit better. The than, writing, yeah, the writing is well done. Anyway, this is a little bit about the rule of Saint Benedict, and uh, Father Cruzar says the following. He says. The spirit of the Benedictine rule is none other than the spirit of the gospel, applied in life based <clears throat> upon the evangelical consuls. This is distinctly stated in the short introduction which Benedict wrote for his rule. Its expression is as clear and fresh as the balmy air breathed in that monastery on the mountaintop. Everything that the saint says in this preface and then applies in the book itself is in fact as distinct and lucid as the southern sky which covers Monte Cassino and the verdant plains of the Campania below it. Mm -hmm. And now he begins quoting. Here my son, says the founder of, uh, to his disciples, adapting the words of scripture, the precepts of thy teacher and incline unto them thine ear and thy heart. Receive gladly thy father's counsel and obey it. Return unto God by the different path of obedience for which thou hast forsaken him by following thine own will in disobedience. I speak unto thee who hast resolved to forsake thine own desires and enter the service of the true King, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thou wouldst fain to be girded with the fine and powerful weapon of obedience. Pray then, before all, most earnestly, that strength from above may be granted thee to carry out the good thou hast begun. So this is the very first thing um, he assumes that the monks that are going to follow uh, his rule and, uh, and to uh, come to him have fi finally given up on their own disobedience and their own will, and they're now going to bend their will to God's will. That's the first step. And then the rest just flows from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, St. That's Benedict. Mm -hmm. um, the other individual that we really want to say something about then, too, is uh, is St. Gregory the Great. And again, I'm going to start off with a quote, and this not from necessarily a um, um, a friendly source. Okay. Okay, this is from the Cambridge Medieval History. Oh. Uh, volume 2. It's uh, also rather heady stuff, but as I say, uh, this is a secular... Of history, it's it's not meant to be particularly religious, but it's covering the Medi uh, Middle Ages, and you've got to say something about religion. <laughs> and this is what they said about uh, Gregory. Okay, <laughs> it says this: If the sixth century after Christ was one of the great ages of worlds of the world's history, now see. That's not what we get out of our textbooks nowadays. No. You know, you, you have pictures of, of Vikings and madmen and, and, right. and Germans running around and horns and their, mm -hmm. and their helmets and all that. But he, they're saying, and these are, these are professional historians, they're saying, wait a minute. He says, if the 6th century after Christ was one of the great ages of the world's history, it would not be difficult to claim for Pope Gregory I that he was the greatest man in it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. impressive. The claim would be contested on behalf of the Emperor Justinian uh -huh. and the monk Benedict of Nursia, if not by many other who influenced the course of affairs. But if the work of many evil leaders of men is to be judged by its result on later ages. Gregory would seem to occupy a position of commanding greatness, which is unsaleable. Wow. Isn't that something? So, 
they're telling us that this is um, that this this individual, this this Pope Gregory the Great. And there's a reason why they call him great. Uh, even secular historians, uh, looking at this period honestly, would say that as much as so many others, Justinian. I mean, I learned we're talking about the Justinian Code. Um, uh, Benedict, we're talking about the father of Western monasticism, and yet um, it, it's to Gregory that they turn to and say, this is the one man that sets the course for the um, for the Middle Ages in, in, in all the and the high um, sense of that. You know, we, as we went through medieval history, we we know there were ups and downs, and there, it, that was a hard and tough period of time. Right. But the church endured, mm -hmm. and the reason why the church endured was obviously because it was protection from the Holy Spirit, but it also was grounded on some very important things, and one of those was uh, Gregory uh, himself. Ooh, all right, let's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely classical youth, you know, uh, we know of his schooling, uh, grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, so all that, you know, uh, did very well at it, evidently rose up to the point of being the prefect of Rome. Uh, he was uh, uh, given that honor in 573. Now, remember, the prefect is is uh, is like a mayor, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's responsible for everything. Um, while he was prefect, his father died, and his mother then um, left the home and went into a convent and retired to a convent for the rest of her life. Um, Gregory was so impressed, I, evidently, by the way in which his father died, um, and we don't know much about him, but evidently it was it was must I mean, it must have been saintly, and then certainly the saintly retirement of his mother, that Benedict himself, or I'm sorry, uh, Gregory himself then gave away um, his estates, all of his own estates. He then took the money from those estates and and endowed six monasteries. Oh my God. Yes. And then took the rest of that and uh, and gave a dis uh, disseminated the rest of it out to the poor of Rome. He then took his own palace, uh, which is on one of the, the Roman hills, the uh, the Salian Hill, and he turned it into a monastery. And then also went into a another monastery, not even his own, but went into another monastery. Uh, this being the monastery of Saint Andrew, and lived there for three years. While he was there, he came in contact with uh, some boys from uh, the the British Isles. Uh, I'm not sure what they were doing in, in Rome at the time, but anyway, they, they were there, and they were not Britons. They were actually uh, Germans. Uh, they belonged to the tribe of Angles. Okay. And uh, it, some people have had some fun with the punning that, that goes on about that, because uh, evidently he himself had said, do you mean Angles or Angeli? Ah. Okay. Are you, are you angels or angels? You know, and um, but anyway, that that was the end of that, and he put that aside and went on. Uh, in 578, he was uh, ordained one of the seven deacons of Rome. So now he's switched gears. Uh, no longer the secular ruler of Rome, but now one of the seven assistants to the pope. Okay. Um, he spent time working on a, on a plague that had attacked the city of Rome, and he helped to um, organize uh, relief efforts for that. There was also a, a terrible flood around that time, and he was also uh, heavily involved in uh, flood relief. And then the Lombards invaded, and he was also involved with um, relief for the, uh, uh, for the Romans who had been attacked by, by the, uh, the Lombards. Um, the Pope then, in 579, this is and all that happened in one year, by the way. Wow. Yeah. And the next year, uh, the Pope then sent him to um, Constantinople, uh, basically as his representative. Uh, the, the title is an Apocrisarius, and I, I don't know what that is exactly, but that was his title uh, when he gets to... Um, um, gets to Constantinople. He has an opportunity to spend some time looking at imperial government 
uh, he spent six years in Constantinople, and he uh, can see the working of of the of the imperial government. Um, he has an opportunity to talk to a lot of uh, religious people of that part of the world, including heretics. He found their, uh, it very interesting to uh, to study their heresies and try to find the difficulties with with those. By 580, uh, 585, he had learned a lot. Uh, but he himself would say, I learned a lot but accomplished nothing while I was there. Um, and so in 590, uh, Pope Pelagius died. And so he returned back to Rome. And when he did, um, there was a huge welling up of people insisting that Gregory be ma named, uh, named the next pope. And so he was. On September 3rd of 590, um, Gregory I lives a very ascetical life and uh, almost a, a monastic life himself. He takes um, the papal estates, and, and by now uh, there had been many uh, 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 estates and latifundiae um, given over to um, uh, the, the Pope as a uh, uh, as gifts. Uh, you know, when people would die, they would endow uh, the uh, the Pope with this, and so the the funds then from all of these estates were used in order to feed the poor of Rome, uh, the farms and and uh, and herds and all those sorts of things. Um, in fact, what he found was that uh, uh, that he was the largest landholder in all of Italy, all of central Italy. <laughs> and he also found that, therefore, he was um, threatened, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly from the Lombards. And uh, one in particular, um, uh, there was a, a king, um, Ari Luf. Uh, who was um, very interested in taking these lands. Now, taking the land, now, when we look at the papal states and papal lands and all, uh, and, and, we're, and we think in terms of that being papal property, often we think of it simply as uh, uh, wealth that the pope has. But we always have to constantly remember that this was feeding the poor of Rome. Right. And, and Rome had, has not been a self-sufficient city mm -hmm. for a thousand years. You know, even back at the time of the emperors, they always had to import um, grain from, from Egypt in order to keep the people fed in Rome. And so uh, losing papal lands means lots of starvation on the right. parts of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he had good reason to... Uh, um, uh, to be concerned about that. And he was able to bring together um, four different cities in order to uh, counteract the, uh, the Lombards. And uh, this, these were the cities of Genoa, Naples, Ravenna, and then Rome itself. And so um, he, he then was able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, collect all of this together. Um, but even under attack... Uh, Gregory was um, was was collected. Um, he was able to actually convince one of the other Lombards, uh, this by the name of uh, Agalof, uh, to abandon the siege of Rome, and and using lots of persuasion abilities to do that. He had a wonderful ability, which was rare uh, at the time, of of working to uh, to build close relationships. With the uh, with the Byzantine Empire, that had almost been lost, and he's able to reconstruct some of that. Much of it, of course, because of his uh, his, his six years right, in Byzantium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, in 595, when um, uh, when uh, a, a bishop um, Syriacus was made the Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Gregory sent his congratulations both to the new patriarch, but also to the emperor for having made such a wise uh, choice uh -huh. for, uh, for bishop. It's around this time then he also began to uh, remember the angels, the, uh, or the angles. And um, 
that year, what he did was he came up with the idea uh, because there was a lot of slavery going on. And so he came up with the idea of purchasing um, these, uh, these Angle boys uh, who were being used as slaves and then freeing them and inviting them to stay on as catechists or, or, um, or to be catechized in Gaul. And, uh, and then um, these were then gathered together and, and they joined an, another monk in the area. This is the um, uh, Augustine, not Augustine not the Hippo. Yeah. Um, but this is going to be um, Saint of, Kent? of Canter Canterbury. Canterbury. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then Augustine will go over to Britain um, bringing these uh, young catechists, these Anglo catechists with him. And uh, what we're going to have is a re-Christianization of Britain. Uh, remember that, that Britain was, had been Christianized, certainly at the time of Patrick, but then uh, through the German invasions, the Angles and the Saxons and the Norsemen and all the others, uh, it, had, it had become pretty much of a wasteland again. Those pagan Angles now are going to be converted mm -hmm. by their own people, uh, by y these young Angle men who uh, were part of this... Uh, had uh, freed yeah, and freed and Freed and, yeah, studied. and studied, yeah. Um, they are instructed by some of the best, um, uh, by um, Virgilius of Arles. Um, he then is, uh, uh, Virgilius is then, uh, receives a letter from St. From, from Gregory instructing him to consecrate Augustine as a bishop. And so then uh, he will be able to go over to, England and, and began the, the process of, of reconverting uh, England again. Um, you know, there's, there's so many other things that can be said uh, about uh, Gregory, um, his concern for <coughs> the liturgy and the, um, the heightening of, of the liturgy and the sacredness of the Mass itself, and particularly his concern for the way in which um, the liturgy is sung, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that including the liturgy, the hours, as well as the um, uh, as the mass. And uh, the monks had, for some while now, been involved in in chanting um, those prayers. Uh, we have to remember that uh, there there were not many books around, mm -hmm. and um, and these these monks knew the scriptures so well. Saint Vincent of Laren had told them to to familiarize themselves with, um, with Scripture all day long, to have a passage, to constantly repeat over and over again. It's hard for us to realize in the 21st century that there were people who could actually recite the entire psalmody, 150 psalms from memory. It does seem <laughs> seem like it would be extremely difficult to me. And yet they did. And they did. And they, yet they, they did. Right. Yeah. A uh, part of that was because that's what they put it to song. meditated on, put it to, right, and right. yes, and put it to song, mm -hmm. and so it was this chant mm -hmm. that was uh, taken, and then f uh, particularly through the the uh, the working of Gregory, we have what we call today Gregorian chant. Yes. You know, and uh, so anyway, he's he's involved, and in, that's the other great thing that we have uh, with him. Um, again, I'm, I, a little quote from uh, Cambridge um, Medieval History it says this, All over the world, Gregory has taught men to look to the Pope as one who could make peace and ensure it. On this foundation, the medieval papacy was founded. Not long was it contented so to rest. Oh. Okay. But that's the grounding. And, mm -hmm. and Every pope in the Middle Ages that looked back looked back to to Gregory the Great. Even when we look, we remember the great reform that takes place that helps to free the church from feudalism. Mm -hmm. uh, that's done through who? Pope Gregory the Sixth and Pope Gregory the Seventh. And I'm sure that they chose those names. Gregory the Seventh definitely chose that name to honor Gregory the Sixth. Gregory the Sixth, uh, I, I think, probably chose it because he was remembering Gregory the First. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, uh, that's that. And uh, what I'd like to do is is turn our attention to 
um, this idea of the hermeneutics of continuity. And um, this is, um, as I say, this is something that, that has been, as a term, been bandied about quite a bit. And uh, I came across this again in a, a book that was just recently published. Uh, it, its title is Vatican II, Renewal Within Tradition. And it's a, a, a um, compilation of, of several articles. Uh, one of the reasons I was so interested in this, uh, getting it right away, was uh, one, of, uh, one of the articles is co-authored by Dr. Uh, Lawrence Welsh, who is on the faculty at uh, Kendrick Lemon Seminary. And he, so he did one of the articles here. Uh, but it's edited by Matthew Lamb and Matthew Levering. And it's a wonderful little book. Uh, it's available, you know, through uh, bookstores. I, I got this at the uh, the Daughters of St. Paul, and uh, it's it's a really good book for someone who is serious about understanding what happened at the Second Vatican Council, what really happened at the Council itself, um, because we have we have been told so often uh, through the hermeneutics of of rupture mm -hmm. that uh, we have the Church. It goes up until the 1960s, and then boom, there's this rupture, and we have a new church uh, that happens. That um, that Trent is thrown away, that the First Vatican Council is thrown away, that the old church is thrown away, and we have something new instead. And um, a lot of people believe that. I think probably if you took a, a, a poll, probably most Catholics would believe that. Uh, some would be happy with that and say, uh, yeah, now we've we've opened the windows and everything you know, and all this sort of stuff. Um, others would be lamenting this, but they also agree with it. And, and uh, some of them would argue that, uh, and these are schismatics, sy right. would argue that um, the Sec Second Vatican Council was hijacked by the modernists and therefore is not legitimate and no pope afterwards is legitimate. And you can go on websites and find um, all kinds of, weird cases of people yeah. who now claim that they're, they're the Pope. Isn't there one in Oklahoma or something? Uh, Kansas. <laughs> Kansas, yeah. Kansas is yeah. where he is. Pope okay. Michael the First. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he lives at uh, his mom's ranch. Right, right, right. Well, and, and he's not alone. There's, no, I know. know. I know there's not. <laughs> I know there are many more that claim, yeah. claim the title. But. Well, you know what... Um, what Cardinal Ratzinger was trying to tell us and teach us all throughout the period of time when he was working with and for Pope John Paul II, what Pope John Paul II was trying to exemplify in his pontificate, and now Cardinal Ratzinger, as as Pope Benedict XVI is doing again in in, in spades, mm -hmm. is to show that in fact there is a continuity between the Church as it comes up to the Second Vatican Council and the Council itself. And what this book does, what, what the neat thing about this book, is that it takes it, it's broken down according to the documents, okay. and each document is taken. And it says, now this is exactly what the document says, because part of our problem is most people have never read the documents. Right. They just say, oh, this is the spirit. Of, you know. spirit of, but right. if you read the documents itself, they're, they're quite incredible. I, I, a couple years ago, uh, Cardinal Dulles was, um, uh, came to our seminary mm -hmm. and gave a uh, talk. And that afternoon, we had a little reception for him, and there were oh, five or six of us gathered around him talking about different things. And somebody said, um, Cardinal, what do you use for your own spiritual reading? And, and he said, I use the Vatican II documents as spiritual reading uh -huh. and, and in grist for, for meditation. And um, I started doing the same thing, and it really is uh, quite, quite an eye-opener. What they do in this book is they show that the documents themselves are grounded in what came before, and that there is a continuity. In, in fact, one of the uh, one of the most important, of the, er, the first document to be promulgated, is uh, is concerning the liturgy itself, and uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and even in the Council, if if you read the day book uh, of the speeches and all, at one point, uh, one of the bishops stands up and says to everybody else. We're wasting a lot of time writing a new document. Let's just go back over and take Mediator Dei by Pope uh, Pius XII and just use that. Well, they didn't, but actually they used a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a continuity. There's, there's that um, hermeneutics, the understanding 
of a continuity that takes place. In each of the documents, we find the same thing. So I think that's the brilliance of, of this particular book, of Vatican II, Renewal Within Tradition. And um, in the introduction, what caught me and my attention was uh, this paragraph, because I think as we step back, th what they're calling for in, um, uh, in, in an understanding of church history is in fact what we've been doing the last couple of years in putting this program together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're uh, speaking of a philosopher, uh, Robert uh, Sokolowski, and uh, they'll be referring to him in a couple minutes. But l listen to this paragraph, okay? They say, the authors say this Sokolowski goes on to call for Catholic scholars to place the Council within the proper Catholic theology of history. The church is no mere ideology, but is instead the locus, the place, of Christ's sanctifying truth by the power of his spirit. The church draws us into a personal encounter with the Redeemer, who invites us to share in the very life of the Trinity. This is good news indeed and it cannot coexist with an ideological reading of the church's tradition. Sokolowski observes, and we're quoting here, without Episcopal teaching in continuity with the apostles and with Christ, there is no sanctification and government, and there can be no Catholic church. And then the authors continue, other kinds of churches and theologies of history might be possible without such continuity, but not a Catholic one. As he says, therefore, one of the greatest challenges to the church is to reestablish the continuity between the present church and the church throughout the centuries to revalidate the tradition of the church. This task requires a theological hermeneutics of the council. So, as I say, I, I don't think we did anything else in, in this, uh, this audio series. Um, we showed, I think, uh, pretty persuasively, I think, um, from, from the time of the Pentecost all the way up to, as we showed today, um, Gregory, um, Benedict, uh, even Fulla mm -hmm. um, and, and Patrick, we, we see f these four linchpins bringing us into the Middle Ages. Uh, remember, we started out with the Middle Ages with the mad, mad, mad Ver Merovingians, right. um, chaos all over the place, mm -hmm. but the church didn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first several of those sessions, we showed how the church was able to save Western civilization and then continue that rebuilding. Feudalism comes apart, comes uh, comes about because of the of the incredible attack on Europe by um, by the Norsemen, uh, by the Muslims, and by um, the Magyars, and yet uh, even after feudalism saves Western civilization in that way and does terrible harm to the church, mm -hmm. the church is able to reform itself through those monasteries through the holy emperors and, and uh, empresses like Adelaide um, and, and through uh, reforming popes. And then as we went in and, uh, and, and, and uh, finished off that, that series, we saw the uh, blossoming of the 13th century, of that, that great era of learning, of commerce, of Thomas Aquinas, all those saints. And then we saw all of that fall apart through... Uh, huge uh, death um, and and then going into that 14th century the bubonic plague, the hundred years war, the papal schism and yet the church didn't uh, go away, it stayed it, it endured and it built itself back up again uh, finally solving its problem through the Council of Constance and the papacy of um, uh, of, of uh, uh, Pope um, Martin V uh, we go into the Renaissance, and, and we saw some of the hubris of some of the popes, Alexander VI, and, you know, and Julius II, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, most of those Renaissance popes trying to tap into Christian humanism and making sure that the humanism of the Renaissance was Christian. And in fact, anybody that studies the history of art will show you 
most of that art done in, in the uh, Renaissance was religious. Right. It was an expression of, of the joy of the incarnation. You know, and 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 then I mean, we continued on with our history into uh, through modern history, and we saw that there had been there was there was this alternative ecclesiology working, and uh, and it didn't go away, and finally it exploded into the Protestant Reformation, even as the church was reforming itself yet again in the uh, late 1400s and early 1500s, and now there is a rupture there. But that rupture is, is a break from continuity. And, of course, it, it becomes discontinuous itself into 27,000 denominations. But the church itself, the Catholic Church, continues that continuity throughout its own Reformation, its counter-Reformation, when, when it counters... Um, I mean, it takes 40 years, 50 years, for the Protestants to get their theology together so that we can even talk to them about it. Mm-hmm. And that's the Council of Trent. And then the great wave of saints that comes about afterwards. Um, you know, so, oh, Lord, so many. Um, uh, uh, Vincent de Paul and, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, of course, you know, the mortar, mortars before all of that. And, then, and, and, and it continues on. You know, it, 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 we, we survive the so-called enlightenment. And uh, much more enlightened than the Enlightenment. We survived the French Revolution. We survived the fascists. We survived the communists. You know, and so we, we bring ourselves down to the continuity of where we are today. And uh, if that's what um, the authors of this book ask us to do, ask somebody to do, well, there you go. You did, and you did <laughs> it. And Oh, Father, I cannot thank you enough for myself and for everyone who listens. And um, just briefly, um, you Everyone, I hope, knows that these programs are available on Father's website, which is www.michaeljohnwitt.com. Right. And, you know, you can go and get them there and listen over and over and over. Because as you just went and just took us through history, you just said, <laughs> all these flashes are going through my mind, all these pictures of everything that we've discussed over the years. And yeah. how wonderful and exciting yeah. that it's right there and available for us. Well, thanks be to God and, and to Covenant Network that it was, this is possible. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, yes, thank God that Covenant Network is here, and but thank you for being here to present it, because without you, no one would have given us the, the joy <laughs> of learning history as you have. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Father. Okay, Tracy. May God bless you, and please, I ask everyone to keep Father in your prayers. Thank you. I need that. And so we all pray together. Sure. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was, so was in the, the beginning, beginning, is now, and, and ever shall, shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight. <laughs>